Good afternoon or good evening. Paul Carice, I'm the director of the School of Civic and Economic Thought and Leadership here at Arizona State University, and we are very glad that you could join us either in person or streaming online for this fourth event in the school's speaker series this year. Our theme this year is Renewing America's Civic Compact. The larger series, the Civic Discourse Project, is now in its fifth year, and we have been delighted this fall to return to in-person events. So especially for those of you here in person, thank you for helping us to rebuild civic discourse. And we are happy to be collaborating again with Arizona PBS. They're recording all the events in the series. As I mentioned, we are live streaming tonight's event. And then edited episodes will be posted on the Arizona PBS website. We also encourage you to look on our own school's website for the archive of all the scheduled speaker events and webinars actually for the past five years. That includes all of the individual speaker events, the dialogue events in the Civic Discourse Project. Our website is scetl at asu.edu. And on the theme of civic discourse, we are happy to have with us tonight several civic leaders from the Arizona community and also some ASU faculty and staff from other units. And I'll just briefly mention that Senator John Kyle is here, Lyndell Manson, the chair of the Arizona Board of Regents, and Adam Chutterow, who's the interim dean of ASU's O'Connor College of Law. Our school tries to convene a high-level conversation in the Civic Discourse Project with single speaker events, dialogue events like tonight's event, and an annual conference, all together trying to encompass a range of views. This practice of intellectual diversity and civil disagreement is a public extension of the academic program of the school with courses and degrees and student experiences that try to connect liberal arts education with civic education. So we hope the students who are here, or those of you who care about students, uh, we'll get some information in the registration table outside about our degrees and our academic programs that the school offers, uh, or you could also take a look at our website. Tonight's dialogue event is the first of a three-part series this year entitled, Can We Talk Honestly About Race? The school's friend and partner at the law school, Professor James Weinstein, approached us with this idea and we're grateful for the support of the former dean of the law school, Doug Sylvester, and the current dean, Adam Chuttero, in helping us to make the series a reality. So now to briefly, not adequately, briefly introduce our two distinguished speakers for this dialogue event. I'll introduce both of them and then ask you to join me in welcoming them to Arizona and to ASU. Glenn C. Lowry is the Merton P. Stoltz Professor of the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Brown University. He's taught previously at Boston, Harvard, and Northwestern universities, and at the University of Michigan. As an economic theorist, he's published widely and lectured throughout the world on his research. He's also among America's leading writers and critics on racial inequality. He's been elected as a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association, as a member of the American Philosophical Society and the Council on Foreign Relations, and as a fellow of the Econometric Society and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Professor Lowry's books include One by One from the Inside Out, Essays and Reviews on Race and Responsibility in America, The Anatomy of Racial Inequality, Ethnicity, Social Mobility, and Public Policy, Comparing the United States and the UK, and most recently, Race, Incarceration, and American Values. Responding to Professor Lowry tonight is Khalil Gibran Muhammad, the Ford Foundation Professor of History, Race, and Public Policy at Harvard's Kennedy School, and the Suzanne Young Murray Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies. Khalil is the former director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture within the New York Public Library, and formerly was a professor at Indiana University. His scholarship examines the intersections of race, democracy, and inequality, as well as criminal justice in modern US history. He is co-editor of Constructing the Carceral State, a special issue of the Journal of American History, and the author of The Condemnation of Blackness, Race, Crime, and the Making of Modern Urban America. He served as an associate editor of the Journal of American History and as an Andrew W. Mellon Fellow at the Vera Institute of Justice. Khalil is a member of the Society of American Historians and the American Antiquarian Society, and he has received the Distinguished Service Medal from Columbia University's Teachers College. 
I will add that both of our distinguished guests have written for and been featured in prominent news and public affairs publications and outlets. It would take much too long to list <laughs> even some of those. And that both are from Chicago's South Side. I have that in common. Our format, Glenn will speak for about 30 minutes and then Khalil will respond for about 15 minutes. In part two of the program, the three of us will be together on stage and I will pose some follow-up questions. Then in part three of the evening, you'll see we have a microphone out here in the audience. We will take questions from the audience. Then we invite everyone to stay for a reception. So for this dialogue on what are the causes of racial disparities in contemporary America, please join me in welcoming Glenn Lowry and Khalil Muhammad. I'm going to take a seat here. Uh, my back is bothering me, and uh, I'll be more comfortable this way. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thanks to everybody for coming out. Thanks to Khalil. I appreciate it. I'm a black American intellectual in an age of persisting racial inequality in my country. I'm an Ivy League college professor and a descendant of slaves. I'm a beneficiary of the civil rights revolution, which made possible for me a life that my forebears could only dream of. I'm a patriot who loves this country. I'm a man of the West. I am an inheritor of its great traditions. So what, I ask, are my responsibilities here? I feel compelled to represent the interest of my people, but then that reference is not unambiguous. I'm an intellectual, and as an intellectual, at a moment of racial reckoning in my country, I declare here, now, for all the world to hear, that no matter the political turmoil that may envelop us, my fundamental responsibility is to stay in touch with reality and to insist that others do as well. Here is my fundamental political premise. Americans of all stripes have a great deal in common. These commonalities can and should be used to show how bridges can be built between black America and the nation as a whole. At bottom, we all want the same things here in this great country. We all want a legitimate shot at achieving the American dream. We all want each generation to do better than the one that came before. We all want to feel secure in our homes and when we're out in public. We want to live in clean and orderly communities with good services. We want the government to work for us and not the other way around. We want to be treated fairly by the broader society and by our institutions. Our commonalities are endless. And connections between various groups in America could be stronger if we focus more on the things that we have in common instead of the things that divide us. It's just too easy to overstate racial problems confronting the country and to understate what we have achieved. The right idea for America, I maintain, is to embrace the ethic of transracial humanism, which Martin King Jr. propounded. We citizens of this great republic must strive to stress the universality of our human condition and the commonality of our interests as Americans. This flies in the face of the dominant anti-racism sentiment in our time, but I insist it's the only way to address an historical legacy of racism without running into reactionary racial chauvinism on either side of the color line. The only way is to march on, if only fitfully and by degrees, toward the goal of creating a world where racial identity fades in significance, a world where no person's worth is seen to be contingent upon racial inheritance, a world where we learn in the fullness of time how to unlearn race as the writer Thomas Chatterton Williams has put it. Promoting anti-whiteness will cause advocates to reap what they sow in a backlash of pro-whiteness. The folks who think they can insist on spelling black with a capital B while keeping the word white in lowercase are likely in for a very rude awakening. Better, by far, better for black people and better for our country would be when thinking about politics and public policy to emphasize our common American interests 
and to de-emphasize our superficial racial differences. Racial inequality is real, of course, but inequality in America is not solely or even mainly a racial issue. There are plenty of poor and marginalized white people in this country, and they deserve our concern, too. Contemporary American politics obsesses to an unhealthy extent about racial identity. Just how important is race? Is it, in the year 2021, an undeniable difference between people like gender, or is it a social construct? Consider, for instance, the growing number of interracial marriages and the ever-increasing number of people who view themselves as multiracial, including the first black president and the first black vice president of this country. We talk incessantly about racial identity, but what about culture? What about values? Don't they transcend race? How are we to explain the alienation that afflicts many prosperous black Americans? These folks are being told that white supremacy threatens them that we've gone back to the 1960s or earlier. They are being led badly astray, in my view. Votes are being sought via the gross exaggeration of legitimate concerns. We've now reached a place where black millionaires like LeBron James seem really to think that they're being hunted down like rabid dogs by rogue cops. Facts seem insufficient to stop such false narratives. And yet, just look what has happened in the last 75 years. A huge black middle class has developed. There are black billionaires. The influence of black people on American culture and politics is stunning and has global resonance. Black Americans are rich and powerful, comparatively speaking. To put it into perspective, there are 200 million Nigerians and the gross national product of that country is about $1 trillion a year. America's GNP is over $20 trillion a year, and we 40 million or so African Americans have claim to roughly 10% of it, which is to say we have access to 10 times the income of a typical Nigerian. What is more, the very fact that the cultural barons and elites of America, those who run the newspapers, who give out the prizes and book awards, who make the foundation grants, who run the human resource departments of corporate America, who run the universities and who make the movies, have bought into the woke racial sensibility hook, line, and sinker gives the lie to such pessimism that the American dream doesn't apply to black people. It most certainly and emphatically does, and it's coming to fruition daily. To dismiss this reality is to tell our children a lie about their country. It is a crippling lie, which when taken as gospel, robs black people of agency and a sense of control over our fate. It is a patronizing lie, which betrays a profound lack of faith in the capacities of us black Americans to rise to the challenges, to face up to the responsibilities, and to bear the burdens of our freedom. At this point, I can hear my critics retort. It is what many of my students at Brown University have been saying to me of late in their classroom comments and in their response papers. But then, Professor Lowry, if the American dream does apply to black folks, why are so many of us catching hell? The civil rights movement notwithstanding, racial economic disparities are a fact of life in the 21st century. Why? It's a difficult question. Answering it requires us to distinguish between the role played by anti-black discrimination, past and present, and the role of contemporary behavioral problems to be found among some blacks. Now, this puts what is a very sensitive issue rather starkly. I willingly acknowledge that anti-black biases continue to exist, and I insist that they be remedied. But it is also imperative to identify the behavioral patterns preventing some black people from seizing newly opened opportunities. In recent writing, I have recast these two positions as causal narratives. The bias narrative argues that the root cause of persisting disparity is found in anti-black racism. Racial discrimination causes racial inequality, so we must reform society to achieve a level playing field. 
It focuses on the demand side of the labor market, for instance. I think such reforms are necessary, but not sufficient. The development narrative, by contrast, is concerned with how people acquire skills, traits, habits, and orientations that foster their successful participation in society. It focuses on the supply side of the labor market. Its premise is that those who lack the experiences are not exposed to the influences and do not have access to the resources that foster and facilitate their human development will, in general, fail to achieve their full potential. Now, and of course, these two narratives, bias versus development, need not be mutually exclusive, but what is clear is that they point in different directions in terms of intervention and remedy. This tension between a focus on demand and the supply side factors in accounting for racial disparities is a very old theme for me. It's what led me to coin the term social capital in my doctoral dissertation at MIT a lifetime ago. In doing so, I was contrasting that concept, social capital, with the more familiar notion, human capital. As you may know, human capital theory studies inequality via a conceptual framework that was initially developed to explain investment decisions by firms, a framework that focused on formal economic transactions. I thought this framework was not adequate when applied to explaining persistent racial economic disparities. I believe my concerns then remain relevant today, and so I will use my time here to explore these ideas more fully. My basic point in that thesis was that associating business with human investments is merely an analogy, not an identity, particularly when thinking about persistent racial disparities. Business investments are transactional. Human investments are essentially relational. So important things were overlooked in the human capital approach, I thought, things having to do with informal social relations. Conventional theory was incomplete when accounting for racial disparities, and there were two central aspects of that incompleteness, which led me to make two observations, one about the dynamics of human development and the other about the nature of racial identity. I want to reiterate those observations here because they remain relevant today. My first observation was this. All human development is socially situated and mediated. The development of human beings occurs inside of social institutions. It is dialogic. It takes place as between people, by way of human interactions, the family, community, school, peer group. It is inside of these cultural institutions of human association that development is achieved. Resources essential to human development, the attention that a parent gives to her child, for instance, are not alienable. Developmental resources, for the most part, are not commodities. The development of human beings is not up for sale. Rather, networks of connections between people create the context within which developmental resources come to be allocated to individual persons. Opportunity travels along the synapses of these social networks. People are not machines. Their productivity, which is to say, the behavioral and cognitive capacities bearing on their social and economic function, these things are not merely the result of a mechanical infusion of material resources. Rather, these capacities are the byproducts of social interactions mediated by human affiliation and connectivity. This was fundamentally important, I thought, and still think, for understanding persistent racial disparities in America, and that is the first point I was making all those years ago about the incompleteness of human capital theory. My second observation was that this thing that we are calling race in America is mainly a social and only indirectly a biological phenomenon. The persistence across generations of racial differentiation between large groups in an open society where people live in close proximity provides irrefutable indirect evidence of a profound separation between the racially defined networks of social affiliation in that society. For there would be no races in the steady state of any dynamic social system unless 
On a daily basis and in regard to their most intimate affairs, people paid assiduous attention to the boundaries separating themselves from racially distinct others. This is so because over time, race would cease to exist unless people were acting so as biologically to reproduce the varieties of phenotypic expression that constitute the substance of racial distinction. I cannot overemphasize the second sociological point. We speak casually about race, racial equality, racial justice, and yet race is not something simply given in nature. Rather, it is a social product. It is something we are making and remaking. That there exist distinct races is an equilibrium outcome. It's endogenous. It follows that if the goal is to understand the roots of durable racial disparities in any society, we must examine in some detail the processes causing race to persist as a fact in that society. Because almost certainly such processes will not be unrelated to the allocation amongst individuals of human developmental resources. Here then is my second observation in a nutshell. We economists need to recognize the limits of our tools to account for durable disparities by race. The creation and reproduction of such inequality ultimately rests on cultural conceptions that people hold about identity, about the desirability and the legitimacy of conducting intimate relations with racially distinct others. And here, I do not only mean sexual relations. Racial inequality is not just the disparity of material resources. More fundamentally, it is rooted in the decisions all of us are making about with whom to associate, with whom to identify. Such, anyway, was the gist of my argument. Thus, social capital, on my account, is an extension of human capital theory. The resources people need for their development are not all commodities acquired in markets as a result of transactions. Some of these resources are embedded in a person's social situation. For example, the, resources mother, the resource of a mother's attention to her health when a child is in her womb. The resource of peers with whom one associates in the things that they valorize, which then become important determinants of the choices one makes about the acquisition of skills. The resource of information about what is possible to achieve that results from one's connection to others who have explored those possibilities. These things are also factors or inputs into the production of skills. Note well, these things are not commodities. A financial deficit does not fully capture a deficit of these things. This was the idea that I wanted to employ to give an account of durable racial inequality even after eliminating most discrimination. Now that dissertation was written in the mid-1970s, a decade beyond the big civil rights laws and quite early in this relatively a uh, new era of fair market opportunities for all people irrespective of race. The post-civil rights era is now more than a half century old. I'm not saying that things are perfect in terms of racial equality of treatment. Obviously things are not perfect, but in terms of the valuation of skills, it is a relatively level playing field. So my provocative claim here is that persisting racial disparities are not necessarily an indictment of the political order because formal transactions and labor, credit, housing, and other markets are not the whole show. Also important are the informal interactions with one's peers in neighborhoods and communities, given the structure of families, the nature of prevailing values, norms, and notions of identity, those to whom one is connected, whom one can call upon, whom one is influenced and informed by. When thinking about inequality and its remedies, my social capital concept disciplines us to appreciate limits of anti-racism regulation in a world where developmental outcomes depend upon informal non-market processes. It shifts attention away from a purely redistributive focus to a relational focus. I'm not saying that people without money have no need of it. What I'm saying is that money may not be the only thing they need. For understanding racial disparity in America, I claim that social relations often come before economic transactions. Now, talking in this way, talking in this way is not blaming the victim. Oppressed groups time and again evolve notions of identity that cut against the mainstream. A culture can develop among them that inhibits youngsters from taking actions needed to develop their talent. And I ask, do kids in a segregated, dysfunctional peer group simply have the wrong utility functions? No. 
It's a mistake to attribute dysfunctional behavior in a historically oppressed group of people to be simply having the wrong preferences when those preferences have emerged from a set of historical experience that reflect the larger society's social structures and activities. By the same token, however, it is a grievous error to ignore the consequences of such behavior or to pretend that it doesn't exist, as many anti-racism advocates are doing. Bearing the burdens of black freedom in America means acknowledging that socially mediated behavioral issues often lie at the root of today's racial inequality problems. They are real and must be faced squarely to grasp why racial disparities persist. Mind you now, these are American problems. They are not merely matters of communal concern to black people. Still, downplaying behavioral disparities by race, it's actually a bluff. Anti-racism activists claim that white supremacy, implicit bias, and old-fashioned anti-black racism are sufficient to account for black disadvantage. Those making such arguments are, in effect, daring you to disagree with them. You must be a racist, they will say, one who thinks something is intrinsically wrong with black people if you don't attribute pathological behavior amongst some of us to systemic injustice. You must think blacks are inferior, for how else could you explain the disparities? In calling their bluff, one risks being convicted of the offense of blaming the victim. But this is a dare, a debater's trick. At the end of the day, what are those folks saying when they declare that mass incarceration is racism, that the high number of blacks in jail is self-evidently a sign of racial antipathy? To respond, no, it's mainly a sign of antisocial behavior by criminals who happen to be black, one risk being dismissed as a moral reprobate. This is so even if the speaker is black. Just ask Clarence Thomas. Nobody wants to be canceled, but we should all want to stay in touch with reality. Common sense and much evidence suggests that those in prison are mainly those who have hurt somebody, who have stolen something, or have otherwise violated the basic behavioral norms that make civil society possible. Yes, it is possible to argue that our collective response to crime in America is and has been too punitive. I've made that argument myself. I agree. But it is also the case that those taking lives on the streets of St. Louis, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and Chicago are, to a person, behaving despicably. Moreover, those bearing the cost of such pathology are almost exclusively other blacks. An ideology that straightforwardly ascribes this behavior to racism is not credible in my view. Neither could any sensible person actually believe that seven in 10 African American babies being born to a woman without a husband is A, a good thing, or B, due to anti-black racism. People will say it, but they don't believe it, they're bluffing. They're daring you to observe that the 20th century failures of some African Americans to take full advantage of the opportunities created by the 20th century's revolution of civil rights are palpable and damning. These failures are being denied at every turn, but this position is not tenable, I say. The end of Jim Crow segregation and the advent of equal rights were transformative for this country. And now, a half century down the line, we still have significant disparities. That is a shameful blight on American society, I agree. But the plain fact of the matter is that some considerable respon uh, responsibility for this sorry state of affairs lies with black people ourselves. Dare we acknowledge this? Dare we accept responsibility for it? The burden of my argument here is that we black Americans must accept responsibility for and acknowledge the importance of the behaviors of our own children. Even as we work to foster an environment where all members of this society have a fair shot at achieving the American dream. My considered view is that the way to do this most effectively is to embrace the development narrative rather than the bias narrative when thinking about persistent racial disparities. I'm Closing. The overall narrative about their country that we black Americans settle upon is crucial. Is this a good country? One that affords boundless opportunity to all who are fortunate enough to enjoy the privileges and bear the responsibilities of American citizenship? Or is this a venal, immoral, and rapacious bandit society of plundering races founded in genocide and slavery and propelled by capitalist greed and anti-black antipathy? My considered view 
is that the weight of the evidence overwhelmingly favors the former. The founding of the United States of America was a world historic event by means of which enlightenment ideals about the rights of individual persons and the legitimacy of state power were instantiated for the first time in real institutions. The founding entailed a compromise with the institution of slavery, that's true, and yet now some 40 million strong black Americans have become by far the richest and most powerful large population of African descent on this planet. The issue then is a question of narrative. Are we blacks going to look through the dark lens of the United States as a racist, genocidal, white supremacist, illegitimate force, or are we going to see our nation for what it has become over the course of these last three centuries, that is, the greatest force for human liberty in world history? The narrative we black Americans choose will influence our assessment of certain key periods in American history. There is, of course, the Civil War, 600,000 dead in a country of 30 million. The consequences of that war, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, made the enslaved Africans and their descendants into citizens. And in the fullness of time, we have become equal citizens. Should that have taken another 100 years? No. Should my ancestors have been enslaved in the first place? No. But we must not forget that slavery had been a commonplace human experience since antiquity. Emancipation, the freeing of slaves en masse after a movement for abolition, that was a new idea, a Western idea, the fruit of enlightenment, an idea brought to fruition over a century and a half ago in our own United States with the liberation of four million black people. Such an achievement would not have been possible but for philosophical insights and moral commitments cultivated in the 17th and 18th centuries in the West. Ideas about the essential dignity of human persons and about what can legitimate a government's exercise of power over its people. Something new was created in America at the end of the 18th century. Slavery was a holocaust out of which emerged something that advanced the morality and the dignity of humankind, namely emancipation, the abolition of slavery, and the incorporation of African descended people into the body politic of the United States of America were monumental, unprecedented achievements for human freedom. Let me finally call our attention to that escaped slave and great abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who in 1852 in a speech entitled, Who's Fourth of July? asked America whether he had a share in the nation's civic inheritance. Douglas was cautiously hopeful about the prospect that America might be faithful to its founding principles and grant liberty and equality to his people. But he had to plead with his audience to consider the gravity of the circumstance. He had to indict his country for not standing up to its ideals. That was in the 1850s. The question that Frederick Douglass posed, which was an open one at the time, has been answered by history. As a black American intellectual who loves his country, I can say without equivocation in the year 2021 that the 4th of July is ours. It belongs to me, a descendant of slaves, every bit as much as it belongs to any other American. The question confronting us black Americans today then is not whether we are included within the body politic as full heirs to the bequest of American political culture. We most emphatically are. Today's question for us American descendants of slaves is not how to end our oppression. Rather, it is what shall we do with our freedom? What shall we make of the enormous inheritance that is our birthright citizenship in history's greatest republic? Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, first time at ASU, and so just want to acknowledge. Uh, I do have some colleagues here. Um, I don't see them in the audience. I didn't reach out to them before I arrived, but uh, I just want to give them a shout out. Um, some of us were colleagues like Marlon Bailey at Indiana University. Um, you, you learned that Glenn and I are both from the south side of Chicago, and in fact, uh, we do share uh, extended kinship. And so I deliver my remarks in part out of the love 
of our community. And uh, as all of you know in your own personal relationships, uh, even in our own homes, we don't agree. <laughs> and so uh, I offer that with the generosity of spirit that it's intended. So listening to, to Glenn's patriotic words and prideful sentiments about this country as history's greatest republic, one would think that there were not books written within the past two, three, four years about how democracies die or how it could happen here or that white right-wing extremism wasn't a global problem and that racism, white nationalism, white supremacy and neo-Nazism had nothing to do with these things or that January 6th never happened or that the Confederate flag, which had never flown in the rotunda of the Capitol, had not appeared there, or that a lynching scaffold for Vice President Mike Pence had not been built on the Washington Mall. Hundreds of people since then arrested with ties to the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, and so on. And then, of course, you'd have to ignore the FBI's own surveillance that the greatest threat of domestic terrorism comes from white men who are themselves self-identified white nationalists. And then finally, of course, we'd have to ignore the fact that the former president was in fact a de facto leader of many of these insurrectionists. I say all this to say because I teach at a public policy school, a school of government, and it seems impossible for me to try to make sense of the world we live in today, as Glenn has done in his own way, without recognizing the centrality of racism as an organizing principle in the society today. And so much so that a polite conversation that I had earlier today was very much about whether or not the question of the election having been stolen is now in the rearview mirror. I hear in Arizona it seems to be. So you'd have to actually take as a given that the gains of the civil rights movement, as described here, have created such a level playing field in America that the health of the nation is so secure that of all the people competing for scarce resources in this country and elsewhere around the world, black people should be thriving but for their own bad behavior. Glenn repeatedly uses the notion of progress since the civil rights movement. He made reference to black billionaires and a black middle class. And while it is true that there are more black billionaires today than there were before the 1960s, and while it is true there is a very visible black middle class, those one percenters or the 20 percent that they make up within the stratified community of African Americans has been stagnant actually since the 1980s. You don't have to take my word for it, the National Academies of Sciences noted that the greatest economic gains per capita for African Americans occurred between the 1940s and 1960s and by the 1970s began to stagnate. Now before I make a comment or two about the broader claims about why this isn't so much about race because white people are suffering too. Let me remind you that discrimination and systemic racism are not static concepts. And one of the powerful things about being a historian as opposed to perhaps an economist is reflecting on the dynamism of racism. New forms of it are constantly emerging. The test for this, of course, is borne out by our own history. As Glenn has already noted, slavery ended, and then constitutional tests were passed in the 14th and 15th Amendments, part of this great Enlightenment legacy, although I would take issue with that. Uh, I might give him credit for the gradual abolition laws that took place at the founding. I would not give the Enlightenment thinkers credit for the, the, the four million emancipated in the wake of the Civil War. We can, discuss that more. I don't want to use my time unpacking that in its fullness. And so just by way of a classic example, with mass emancipation in 1865, black codes were passed immediately in all the Confederate states. Those black codes were explicitly targeting the so-called freedmen, and Congress 
outlawed them with the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and later with an amendment, the 14th Amendment. What did most southern states do, the states of the former Confederacy? They went on to pass colorblind legislation and essentially created the infrastructure that would last for 100 years up to the Civil Rights Movement with legislation like felony disenfranchisement laws, which are, by the way, the basis today for such laws that remain on the books. But this isn't just a Southern story of this evolving problem of systemic racism. As Northern cities received greater and greater numbers of migrants in the late 19th and early 20th century, these places that had civil rights laws state by state to protect the, the rights of African Americans resolved the problem of shared communal space, of scarce resources and competition over housing and jobs with such things as redlining or restrictive covenants and various forms of racial exclusion by practice or what we classically describe as de facto from schools to stores. And of course the police and vigilantes did the rest. The record of these problems are actually well documented in a series of Blue Ribbon Commissions starting in Chicago in the great era of race riots running all the way through the Kerner Commission report, which conveniently documented by a bipartisan commission of 10 white men, two black men, Republicans and Democrats, that the fundamental problem of Northern racism was a systemic problem. That something like white people created the ghetto, white people sustained the ghetto, white people condoned the ghetto. What did Johnson do? He shelved the report. Nixon was elected. And to some degree, the rest is history. But not so fast, because so much of Glenn's argument about what's possible today depends on what actually comes next. Well, this is almost too cliche to, myth, to mention, end quote, but I will just simply paraphrase. One of many archival reveals in the wake of 1968 to the present was, of course, Nixon's strategy of criminalizing African-American drug use to sustain what would become a war on drugs and turn to massive acts of policing and ultimately to define black radicalism as the very de definition of crime itself, motivating um, and building on Barry Goldwater's success right here in the great state of Arizona. So if we think of that as the starting point, which is not a controversial story of how we think about the civil rights movement, when Glenn makes reference to Martin Luther King's transracial humanism, and today I was given this handy guide to we the people of the United States and thought that uh, if I get stopped anytime soon, I'll be able to quote from the Constitution. It also includes the I Have a Dream address. But what's ironic about this is that Dr. King was not frozen in time as he is on the Washington Mall today. He himself evolved. He evolved to meet the challenges and the unrealized realities of the civil rights movement. In fact, in his final book that is not quoted here, he had this to say about the problem of backlash. Ever since the birth of our nation, white America has had a schizophrenic personality on the question of race. She has been torn between selves, a self in which she proudly professed the great principles of democracy, which we've heard this evening, and a self in which she sadly practiced the antithesis of democracy, what we saw on January 6th. This tragic duality has produced a strange indecisiveness and ambivalence toward the Negro, causing America to take a step backward simultaneously with every step forward on the question of racial justice to be at once attracted to the Negro and repelled by him, to love and to hate him. He went on to say, the step backward has a new name today. It is called the white backlash. But the white backlash is nothing new. It is the surfacing of old prejudices, hostilities, and ambivalences that have always been there. It was caused neither by the cry of black power nor by the unfortunate recent waves of riots in our cities. The white backlash today is rooted in the same problem that has characterized America ever since the black man landed in chains on the shores of this nation. The white backlash is an expression of the same vacillations, the same search for rationalizations, the same lack of commitment that have always characterized white America on the question of race. And not long after this book was published, he was assassinated by a white supremacist. It's also true, of course, that Dr. King was at the lowest point of his 
approval at the time of his killing. So we would have to ignore, like so much else in this current moment, what's happening right in front of us, to also ignore the Dr. King that was quite dour on the prospects of what the civil rights movement had accomplished. But let's also take quick stock of what's happened since then. My colleague here and friend, Glenn, has dismissed mass incarceration as prima facie evidence of racism. But we don't have to necessarily quibble on to what degree people are actually guilty. We can take note that other parts of the world don't use incarceration or policing as a primary instrument of when there is community violence. This is not the only option that we have in front of us. It is also true that there is tremendous unreported and unpunished crime in our society that maps directly on class and racial privilege. If your victim is white, you are more likely to be punished. If you are wealthy, you are more likely to be represented and do less time. None of this is controversial. And so it would be incumbent upon us to actually reflect on the fact that being poor and of color, and especially black, means you're more likely to be punished for what you've actually done, whether you are guilty or innocent. But we could also reflect on wide-scale unconstitutional violations from racial profiling, harassment, and brutality far more significant than the killings of unarmed black people. How do we know this? Because by now we have at least 70 pattern and practice investigations done by various administrations at the federal level to document such widespread constitutional violations. We still are dealing with a country that passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965 and yet fell in disenfranchisement laws by law disenfranchised people well beyond the terms of their sentence. We've also seen reversals of the Voting Rights Act and new, new voter suppression laws. Our schools are resegregated and there are secession movements all over the country to do more resegregation than is already happening. The subprime lending crisis that began in the 1990s accelerated in the Great Recession. Are we only to blame black and brown people for allegedly buying too many are too much home than what they could afford? Well, the evidence actually is clear that long before we got to the Great Recession, black people who qualified for prime loans were sold subprime loans based on shady dealings. There's been a massive erosion since the late 1960s of public sector employment and deindustrialization. Why did this happen? It happened in part because the role of government had, according to the National Academies of Sciences in 1989, been a key factor in creating a black middle class. That black middle class posed problems for a right-leaning nation in the 1970s and 80s that pushed back on government as itself the source of America's problems. Real wage declines have happened for all low-wage workers. There's a smaller safety net in the richest country in the world than anywhere else in a liberal democracy. And according to economists at my own school, it is because of our so-called race problem. The dilution of affirmative action began within 13 years of its deployment. And finally, just to throw a little sprinkle on this cake of, <laughs> of bad news, my colleague who has now since passed, Diva Pager, uh, as part of a body of work that we call audit studies uh, showed that low-wage black workers who had no criminal record were less likely to get a job than low-wage white workers who did have criminal records. Now, Glenn has already conceded to a degree discrimination, and so perhaps this laundry list of systemic discrimination would fall in the bucket of the things that he agrees with. And all that's left is behavior the actual bad choices that people make when they pick up a gun to shoot someone in their own neighborhood. Now he knows, as well as I do, and maybe not you so much, that I've written about this in my book. I've talked about what it meant for high levels of community violence within Irish, Italian communities. And by and large, you had two responses. You had the eugenic and uh, immigration nativist response, and you had the progressive liberal response. Turns out the progressives won. They built a social safety net beginning in the 1890s, accelerating through the New Deal, that essentially offered these indeterminate white working class Americans a piece of the American dream. But they gave it on unfair terms to black people. They couldn't live in those same neighborhoods. 
I hope this isn't controversial, but it is the basis for massive wealth inequalities today. When we have a tenfold uh, difference between the average net assets of a white family, about 170,000 versus 17,000 for blacks, there's no way to understand that without the intergenerational wealth transfers coming from the ownership of private property. But let me say a little word about America's working class in my final uh, remarks. It seems to me that if we are to talk about personal responsibility, uh, then it's fair to make comparisons to how we understand agency within working class white America compared to black America. Because I get it, personal responsibility matters. It's important. People have agency. People make choices. Individual black people should take responsibility for the choices they make. But here's the thing, most of them do. And yes, I said most, because all of them don't. Just like all white people don't make good choices, don't work hard, don't delay gratification, don't stay married, fathers who abandon their children. The rate of illegitimacy in white America has been skyrocketing, as Charles Murray has been writing about, but we haven't been talking much about that. As of late, these problems have become so significant that alcoholism, drug abuse, and suicide have begun to take a toll on the overall mortality rates of middle-aged white Americans. From meth to heroin to opioid, hundreds of thousands of white lives have been cut short with devastating consequences. The economists Ann Case and Angus Deaton coined the term deaths of despair because they saw the relationship between these individual choices to turn to alcohol and drugs these self-inflicted wounds within a broader reality that low-income and working-class white people were losing faith in the American dream. They could see the factory and mine closures. They could see how little low-wage retail jobs paid and how people were always one bad cold away or broken bone from bankruptcy. For all that heartland Americans believe about their own agency, they also know something has changed. The economy is not working for everyone, and that their children's future shouldn't be dimmer than their own. This is why Case and Deaton called these opioid and heroin epidemics deaths of despair, because people are more likely to make harmful choices when they have limited opportunities. And this is why national politicians on the right and the left have talked about making America great again or building back better because there is more economic inequality in America in this great historic republic and indeed in the world at any point in history. We'd have to go back to the era of the Gilded Age in the late 19th century or to the Great Depression in the 1930s to compare the reality white people face today. The federal government, I'll note, has spent billions, billions, Trump alone two billion, on public health responses to the opioid epidemic of today but also spent billions on police and prisons 30 years ago during the crack epidemic. And so if we are to explain that the racial disparities today can be solved through a development narrative where black people improve their cultural institutions, school, parenting, neighborhood, and therefore can achieve the American dream, never mind the fact that I would argue, if I had more time, that the American dream was predicated on the exclusion of black people from it. That the presence and proximity of black people to your so-called American dream meant it wasn't as shiny as you thought it might be. Or if you have happened to be of an immigrant persuasion as a European or later as various new immigrant populations, your proximity to black people also meant you weren't moving along the road to assimilation quite fast enough. This is another form of relational social status. But if I take Glenn's point with the spirit of generosity and the spirit of goodwill that I know he intends, unlike so many out there who we might be gathered today to hear from, then I say humbly that the development narrative is an old strategy. It's not only an old strategy, because at the very moment when black and white people were suffering in the Gilded Age, they did experiment with interracial alliances. And you know why they didn't work? Because elites drove a wedge between them and defined blackness as a category that would ensure that white people, if they didn't get it in a paycheck, or if they didn't get their health care, or if they had economic insecurity, at least they weren't black. 
And so here we are in this moment talking yet again about a kind of respectability that black people can choose to opt into as if there isn't a history of that journey as well. As if there is any point since the end of slavery when black people didn't absorb the messages of personal responsibility as the best recipe to overcome the racism that they experienced that Glenn, I know, would not disagree with for most of the 20th century. And yet, it never worked. It didn't even work by the standards that Dr. King himself would have wanted in the wake of the disappointments of the civil rights movement of which I started this lecture today. And so we have a choice. We have a choice to reckon with our actual past as it was lived and not in the aspirational American exceptionalism that continues to animate hopes and dreams and yet the failed nightmare and reality for so many people who struggle at the margins of our society. Glenn may be right that black people per capita make about $30,000 of a trillion dollar income that they take relative to the rest of the world. But I would argue what a terrible standard given what we know of the history of colonization and the resource extraction and the mass death of the global south in the interest of the wealth of the global north. Should we be happy as black people sitting on top of a global empire that itself is the apotheosis of taking from people all over the world in the name of civilization and progress? It seems to me that that is ultimately going to be the ruin of our planet. And with that, I will say, with all due respect, this is a friend of mine. We have grown in distance over years over some of these issues, but I know his heart is in the right place. I respect his frame of mind, uh, but I still will continue as robustly as I can to try to convince him that he is wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, both of you, uh, not only for coming a long way from the East Coast to be here with us in Arizona, but uh, to pick up on that last point from Khalil, that two of you agreed a long time ago to share a stage with each other, knowing how much you disagree uh, on these important topics and very contentious topics. So let me start by saying thank you to both of you. Um, I have, I think, time for three questions, and I, I mean them to be posed to both of you, but for this first one, I'll pose it first to Khalil. Um, about the, the theory of anti-racism, the view that America is and has long been systemically racist, is, is there a paradox, or more than a paradox, maybe a contradiction? So if America is so systemically dominated by white supremacy, how is it that this anti-racist theory has come in recent years fairly quickly to be so dominant in higher education, in, in media and, and uh, journalism, and, and even in major corporations? How would we explain what appears to be the, the, the paradox or maybe contradiction there? Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll give a quick answer and then if we want to unpack it. I think there are two things. There's social media and then because of social media, there is the, un just the undeniable evidence of state violence. Um, the powder keg for all of this uh, are viral videos of what appear to be innocent people being executed on the street. And you know we could call out their names, but I think to some degree that is the occasion that both explains the acceleration of this most recent racial justice movement. And I know personally, because we did this at Brown a few years ago, it's also something that really troubled Glenn in particular in the way that it was being framed. Uh, I think that the power of history is in the way in which historical narratives animate people's uh, calculation of how to measure the problem in front of them. And so just as Dr. King made reference to the failures of the Reconstruction period, the schizophrenic vacillation, this generation of young people uh, looked at the massive emergence of a criminal justice state uh, on its own terms, looked at the indices of racial disparities in income and wealth, 
and then saw people being killed and shot in the back without so much as being a remote threat to law enforcement. Walter Scott in Charleston, North Carolina, for example, or Laquan McDonald in Chicago. You, you, you know, the list goes on. And, and everyone doesn't have to be an innocent person to be unjustly killed by the police. Um, and so that is those two things, the ability for us to see with our own eyes, as well as people's uh, increasing reflection on history as the baseline for understanding what are we to make of this in this moment? Why is this still happening? So then a certain set of elite institutions responded beyond social media to adopt, to adopt the anti-racist view, even though well, uh, white supremacy is much more widely spread beyond those elite. Uh, I'm, 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 there's, there's a strange kind of like focus on elite institutions. It was basically working class community-based organizers who use Twitter to call attention to state violence. Now, whether or not elite institutions from the media to foundations then uh, legitimated that activity and helped to support it, is if that's what you're asking about, then I would agree, yes. But I think we would want our institutions to respond to a social crisis unfolding in front of us. Um, so. It, we need to just be mindful of when it, where it started. It started not with elite institutions saying, let's do a study on police violence. It started with people uh, organizing around the unlawful death of people. And I also want to emphasize this because places like the Manhattan Institute often point out that out of a thousand police killings, only 18 are African Americans that are unarmed. Um, but the problem isn't the sensational uh, killing of a single individual. The problem is the iceberg that sits underneath the ocean of daily indignities and brutalities of which I made reference to one source of evidence being federal investigations. Glenn? Yeah. I'd say a couple of things. I mean, first I'd say in terms of the anti, the success of anti-racism as an ideology in certain elite uh, venues, that there's an irony. Because if the if the characterization of the society, uh, which Khalil gave voice to at the opening of his remarks as intrinsically racist and white supremacist is correct, if the taint is that great, the stain that deep, how is it that we imagine appealing to the larger society for remedy to the problems of the black community could succeed? It's as if we throw ourselves on the mercy of a court that we are uh, indicting for being intrinsically, intrinsically biased. It, it, it just, the country is not, I'm arguing in my optimism, uh, so tainted, so compromised, so um, wretched uh, in its uh, uh, despising of black humanity that broad appeals uh, have no hope of success. I think they do, and indeed, as I've said, I think they have been largely successful. Um, something else I want to say is police, our police and people killed by police unlawfully are citizens unlawfully killed by police. The fact that the police may or may not be white and that the citizen may or may not be black is a second order consideration. There are many more whites than blacks killed, killed unlawfully by police in this country. We don't have to make that a racial issue. Activists well may seize upon the opportunity of exploiting the racial sentiments in some parts of the population. But these are issues about policing in the country and they should be dealt with accordingly. And the reason I say that is because if we get into the habit of discussing crime, disorder, and violence, whether it be by police or by others in racial terms, we may have a hard time containing that discussion to instances where it's white police officers abusing black citizens. We may soon enough find ourselves in a world where uh, people are calling attention to black criminals preying upon white citizens. I, I don't want to live in that world. Uh, I want to de-racialize the discussion about order maintenance in 2021. 1921, different story. In 2021, I want to talk about it in terms of what police should be doing in their interactions with citizens 
and make race a secondary issue in that. Can I, can I say one thing? Sure. It's an important clarifying point, and I, Glenn can have, have shot back at me. Um, my opening remarks about how democracies die, linking that to various forms of white nationalism here and abroad, was actually not a statement about intrinsically racist America. My comment about uh, Martin Luther King's critique of the backlash was not an endorsement of an intrinsically racist America. Actually, at no point did I characterize the country as intrinsically racist. The truth is, I agree with Dr. King that the nation has two spirits, the one that loves and hates. But both of them don't center black humanity as uh, on its own terms. Both are in the service of whiteness, one degree or another. Blackness is so visible in this country uh, that it creates visibility for white people who either by dint of these elite institutions gain a kind of soul, um, uh, call it the, the coup that Norman Rockwell wrote about. Um, and then the other side of it is the white supremacist problem. You have a John Brown on one instance and a John Calhoun on the other. Um, black people wouldn't be here if there weren't white people who could be appealed to for moral reason and for constitutional principle. Um, and so while there may be activists whose uh, critiques are so narrowly defined that Glenn is responding to. That's not, that's not anything that I've ever articulated n nor written about. And in fact, I wouldn't do what I do if I didn't believe that it was possible to get more white people to live up to those principles. Which is why, for me, what happened uh, two summers ago when something like 15 to 25 million white people took to the streets in support of racial justice was a good thing. But it didn't start with elite institutions. It started with community organizers saying, enough is enough. Next question, or Glenn, do you want to? Uh, I, I want to talk about deaths of despair. I want to talk about an economy that, that doesn't work. And I want to talk about how you change that. And I want to refer to my opening remarks, which is that we have a good deal more in common across the racial line than what separates us and that the right way to discuss public policy, that is to say, the way that's more likely to be politically successful, but also the way that is ethically more defensible, is to look to the humanity of the people who are affected and not to their race. So um, I agree that deaths of despair are uh, a reflection in white America of the kinds of behavioral problems that I pointed out amongst African Americans. I agree that that's the case. But I think the political message that comes out of that is not to compartmentalize our claims on racial grounds, but to look beyond that. And that's what I'm advocating. Uh, I think I've got time really for one more question, and then we'll turn to audience questions. Um, and uh, I'll pose this first to Glenn, but it's obviously for both of you. So two, two of the more prominent presences of an anti-racist theory in American public life in the past few years have been the 1619 Project, and, and Khalil wrote one of the essays in that, uh, mag the initial magazine piece. Um, and another is in an institution like this, higher education, a, a very bold reinforcement of what traditionally were called affirmative action policies, hiring, um, especially for, for faculty positions. So about both of those. Um, was the, let's say, aggressive history revisionism of the 1619 Project justified, even if not fully historically accurate, especially about the American founding, in order to shock America into waking up about persistent racial disparities? And similarly today, on Ibram Kendi's theory, is obvious discrimination against non-black candidates in hiring, say, for, in, for faculty positions in higher education. Is that justified, even though it's obvious discrimination against non-black candidates, in order to shock America into addressing persistent racial disparities? Well, you've asked me. This is the historian here, uh, 1619 Project. I mean, in the um, framing essay, Nicole Hannah-Jones gets wrong, uh, as historians uh, have pointed out the attribution to the founding generation of a motivation for the, uh, for the revolution, which was uh, to protect slavery from the 
pending um, abolition of the, you know, et cetera. Gets that wrong. Um, I think that's important. You can tell from the tenor of my remarks, I'm looking at the founding in a rather different way, and I'm uh, contesting over the uh, national narrative very much in contestation now, given the debates about critical race theory from uh, a point of view more celebratory of, in retrospect, in, with reflection of the American founding. But uh, uh, I, I read the essays, and uh, they were, of, I thought, very uh, quality and compelling nature in the uh, in the uh, compendium of the 1619 project. And you know, Khalil can speak for himself. On affirmative, say something nice about my essay. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait, wait a minute. Let me say that I've been teaching uh, the condemnation of blackness for many years. In fact, I wrote a blurb for that book way back when, when yeah. I said it was the best book that's been written about race in the last ten years when it Ooh. came out. I deeply admire. That's uh, the Glenn I the, came to know and love. <laughs> <laughs> I deeply admire the erudition, the, the historiography that's on display there, and, and the way in which uh, Khalil unpacks in the decades between 1890 and 1930 how the American elites, the intelligentsia, and the media and the politicians reckon with this problem, this indigestible mass of newly freed African descended people who are titular citizens of the country but are. Uh, that, that are, are uh, uh, on the margins. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Khalil Muhammad's a good historian. Um, but I want to say something about affirmative action, uh, which is I don't think, Paul, that the main issue, we'll see what the Supreme Court decides if the Harvard case gets there. I don't think the main issue is the rights of persons who may be discriminated against by the practice of affirmative action. I think, I've been saying this, I'm an outlier, I'm going to say it anyway, that the main issue in the 21st century, a half century past 1970, with affirmative action having become institutionalized as a primary instrument for in the corporation, incorporating African Americans into elite competitive intellectual venues, that the main issue is that this is not a path, ultimately, to equality for African Americans. It, promulgating differential standards of assessment is inconsistent with equal dignity and standing within these competitive venues. It has to be seen as a transitional instrument moving toward a world in which it would be less and less relied upon, and that's exactly the opposite of what's happening now. Kyle? Two big topics. All right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so on the 1619 project, um, so Nicole made uh, an error in the, well, you know, I'm not a Latinist, but it was kind of an extremist problem, not, not a substantive one, meaning that some colonists really did wage war against Great Britain to protect slavery. That's not in dispute. The characterization that it was a primary reason is what got her in trouble. Um, and it's, it's beyond ironic that that point essentially becomes the 1619 Project is trash for all intents and purposes. Um, just, it's just remarkable. So there's a lot of bad faith commentary about a project uh, that now has grown to 18 historical essays and 36 works of creative writing that comes out tomorrow. Pick it up at a bookstore. In, a, in, a, in book form. In book form, correct. Uh, and my essay is very different. But on the larger question of do we need a 1619 project, what does it do for us? So if you're me and you've been teaching history for 25 years, you know, I've lived, I am the first generation of post-civil rights. I'm born in 1972. My parents were born in 1950 and 1952. They were northern kids who didn't experience the classic civil rights struggles, but they experienced all that racist Chicago had to offer, including the legacy of their parents and grandparents. So to some degree, um, I could reflect through the prison of teaching history that whatever we might say of these racial disparities and the dispute between the two of us on how to explain them, they've either stagnated or gotten worse. So that is the fact. As a matter of 
Home ownership, there was a brief uptick in the closing the gap between what is now 71% for white people and 41% for black people that was eroded in the wake of the Great Recession. So you look across most of those indices and black is flat because of the tremendous, overwhelmingly presence of white, extremely wealthy people, which has a weighted consequence on overall white wealth and disparities. It has been going up in an era of booming stock market. So if you look at it from my standpoint, is policy going to get us there? Like, do I have to live my life fighting for another set of public policies to solve for these racial disparities that might not last any longer than the last set of public policies that went on the books? I mean, to me, that's kind of the power of reflecting on the past 150 years. You keep having backlash movements that show up about every two generations. I mean. What I am frustrated with with Glenn's paper is when he doesn't acknowledge the erosion to the very civil rights movement that we might just simply agree voter suppression is not a good thing. When John Roberts says that the landscape of racism doesn't look the same anymore, we're going to gut the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act, which until 2013 had been a kind of rubber stamp for both parties, now is gone. And in the wake of that, States and municipalities across the board get to pass ridiculous laws because we have a massive fraud problem, which doesn't exist, and now it's going to be a lot harder for people to vote. We live in a country where we clearly have a significant portion of the country that doesn't believe that everyone should vote. William F. Buckley said this famously in his debate with James Baldwin, where he joked about white Mississippians being too uncouth themselves to vote. Why should we worry about the Negro? We need to worry about those poor white people. So. So this is a reality. And it seems to me the only way you fix the reality at some other level is to do something you haven't done. This is what, the, the best school for innovation? <laughs> well, it would be innovative to work towards a new set of curriculum requirements that are more honest about the dualisms of our country rather than subscribing to the civic patriotism that has underwritten most social studies curriculums. As an empirical fact, we simply don't teach a history that is as reflective of the complexity of what actually happened in this country. We haven't even used the word settler colonialism, or that we used, we're in a part of the country that used to be Mexico. I mean, it's crazy. And one more point on this. Gordon Wood, who's one of the most prominent American historians of the revolutionary period, who was a prominent critic of the 1619 Project, has himself publicly bemoaned the fact that our history narratives, our civic narratives, need to make Americans feel good about the country they live in. But the critique coming from Gordon Wood and others is that 1619 Project is going to make people feel bad about the history they come from. Uh, the, history, the, the history of the country. If I were to take both at face value, I'd say neither are actually interested in the actual history. I don't actually believe that. I believe our civic narratives and the way that we teach history has often been in the interest of civic nationalism, first and foremost. Secondarily, academic historians have gone on to do what they do, so if you make it to college, you might get a version of history that is more scientific, more rigorous, peer-reviewed, this sort of thing. But that often doesn't trickle down into textbooks. The 1619 Project is asking us to close that gap. Where we end up between what is and what ought to be seems to me will flesh out in the political process as curriculums continue to be subject to revision. But I think that is not only necessary, it is a requirement if we are to build citizens who are more reflective of the choices that we have to make in the present to be more honest about how, uh, you know, the final thing I'll say, how we treat people. So, for example, by a show of hands in the room, how many white women in here think that the level playing field for women exists? There is no glass ceiling, that women are all where they're supposed to be based on talent and skill acquisition. I don't see any hands. Yeah. So maybe a few, right? Just to be fair, there's social pressure here. I understand no one's going to actually participate. But, but it's a fair question. Because if we can acknowledge that gender disparity is function, functions similarly to discrimination 
in corporate America or that East Asians who outperform on tests and other measures that are considered empirical evidence of some kind of talent but are not represented in elite positions of power and privilege, never mind the fact of the reams of social psychology data based on what we call bias, we have a real problem when it comes to how our social networks work, how opportunity structures are, are, are uh, constructed in 2021. And that isn't just about how people show up with what skills they may or may not have. Give me a last uh, Yeah, let me say this. Time for like, time is questions. <laughs> let me say this. Um, it's a country of 330 million people. Blacks are 10% of the population. Blacks and progressives together are a quarter of the population, maybe. If we want to get from here to there, wherever there is, if there is about education, if there is about money for people with uh, kids who don't have enough to eat, if, if there is about uh, occupational uh, development and skills acquisition, wherever we want to go, we want different criminal justice laws, we want better policing, we have to prevail at the ballot box and we have to take seriously the sentiments of our fellow citizens. The fight over the 1619 Project, and more generally over so-called critical race theory, is a fight about the narrative, as I was alluding to in my remarks. It's a fight about how you tell the story of the country. Um, Khalil is not calling America intrinsically racist, he says, and I take him at his word. But a lot of people in his camp certainly are doing that. Uh, Neo-colonialism, colonialism, yeah, true, that's true. And here we stand in the 21st century. We stand on the graves of people who have been exploited and who have been plowed under, that's true. We can live back in the 19th century if, if we want to. Terry McAuliffe would be governor of Virginia today if he had simply said, parents have a legitimate concern about the way in which the story of their country and the nature of our race problem is being taught. But he wouldn't say that. So. I'm okay with, uh, with respectability. I'm okay with not having another summer of 2020 inducing a backlash, which I can then quote Martin Luther King as saying, see there, they were gonna always have a backlash. I'm okay with not having another summer like the summer of 2020. I'm okay with reaching across the aisle to my white brothers and sisters and saying, let's walk hand in hand together, even though it's a kumbaya move. I'm okay because I think that's really the only path forward for our country. Well, thank you for that candid exchange. We, uh, we ran a little bit long. Uh, we've got time, I think, for about two questions. Uh, sure. So I have one question for each of you. Well, uh, just be brief, please. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Glenn, so how do I, as someone who is center-right on the political spectrum, build a bridge between myself and someone who espouses the sentiments that Khalil's comments evidence. So that's for you. And then Khalil, you mentioned this, this need for us to reckon with our past. But your past is not my past. Your public memory is not my memory. I was not born here. And so I'm a first generation Mexican, right? Uh, I voted for Trump. My parents voted for Trump. I'm a tenured faculty here. So obviously the narrative that this country is still, still by and large white supremacist in nature, maybe not the narrative you're talking about, but the public narrative that is, that is going around is not resonating with people like me. Can you articulate a different message to bring folks like me to your side? So yeah, I'm, I'm going to let Khalil answer. I mean, for, how, how do you build a bridge to talk to someone who's on the other side? I have no idea. I haven't got any clue. I'm so concerned about the partisan character of uh, our political life now, I don't know what to do. People don't want to hear anything except what they want to hear. So, you know, I don't know what to say to you about that. I mean, there's a, there's a tremendous irony in, in you quoting Frederick Douglass, right, um, who I know has become a bit of a poster boy for libertarian, so he's making the rounds. Uh, but, but here is a person <laughs> in 1852 and through both the antebellum period as an abolitionist and then in the postbellum period, who never mints words about the contradictions and the ugliness of the country. That speech is a Jeremiah, and he has pointed his, his finger at then a current generation of Americans who he felt 
were letting the founding fathers down because they had doubled and tripled down on slavery. So part of what I'm suggesting is that truth is probably our best pathway to a better because the compromises, I mean, essentially that we've had 350 years of a myth that the nation has not only got it right in the beginning, but is always ever working towards better. That's not what I said. <laughs> well, but you're asking us now to reach across the aisle as if the aisle was broken by the people who spoke up for the suffering of the least of these. So when Dr. King says in that backlash, now, I don't blame the black power activists or the people in the riots. He is speaking in his own way to our moment for blaming people for either writing in a 1619 project and making and alienating people they need to support them, or Black Lives Matter activists who are so woke that they piss off everybody and you lose elections in Virginia. I mean, so my point is that I don't know what the other side of this strategy is, I just know that if we don't do these things, we get more of the same, which looks to me like a massive system that has gotten more and more efficient at discrimination and justifiably so. Okay, Glenn. Yeah. No, I, I'm not even sure where to begin. <laughs> what I want to say is we black Americans in the 21st century, everything is different. The whole demographic profile of the country has been transformed since the 1965 immigration liberalization uh, reforms. Uh, the country is dynamic and it's moving. The world is dynamic and it's shrinking. The Chinese are coming. Uh, we got to put down the ducky, man. We black Americans need to put down the very compelling historical narrative of our, vict of our victimization and embrace the reality of our condition. We are blessed, we are rich, and everything is possible for us. We can make a contribution to this country by relinquishing this whipping thing, this, this thing of you see, you see, you're racist, you're racist, you're racist. I want us to go forward into the 21st century as one country. I want us to get beyond race. We got to start somewhere. We might as well start here. Uh, we have time for one last question. Thank you. Okay, yeah. but I need a little leeway. I am pre-civil rights, okay? So I lived segregation, all right? And I'm sure you did. Um, so what I'm looking at is hearing people say that this is not systemic racism. I am living proof that white man that I married in 1964 Ignorance in not teaching the truth of this country is what's killing us. I was a high school counselor in all white schools. So, Dr. Lowry, I would suggest you go back and talk to those white kids who know nothing about there even being laws against interracial marriages, okay? They don't even, and adults don't even know it exists. And I say that part of the problem is, a lot of the problem is, lack of education about the truth of a country that we've been allowed to say, one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. I stopped saying the flag, flag salute before Kaepernick because I don't have justice. My daughter did in seventh grade because she said she didn't have justice. Now, my daughter is 47. My son is 53. So now, can, so can, so I'm okay, sorry. I'm going to say I, one more I, thing. No, I, I like, can you, pose a, can you pose a question? I'm going to pose a question. Okay. But when he and I got married in 1975, 73, we sold our house in South Phoenix. Systemic racism. She put the house on the market for 19000 We sold it for 19000 She went downtown Phoenix and t they told her, 1973, you can't sell that house in that area for that. 
so she had to drop the price. My question, are there, do either of you see any similarities between what happened after the Civil War and how the government let things move back into what I call slavery? And what is happening now, and I'm going to say the Republican Party, what is happening now with voting rights, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for listening. Well, again, this is out of like, you know, a, a conversation is going to continue over dinner. But um, when Glenn, when you toss it back to me, what's unfair about that is, you know, I listen to blogging heads, I tune in. What is your take on Donald Trump? What is your take on white supremacy? Because it seems to me like it's either an inconvenient problem for the analysis um, or you have a lot of thoughts that you just don't share very commonly. I would love to hear your take on that because because I think it's a problem. Let me say two things about Trump. Uh, one, when Trump won the election in 2016 and um, engendered this dynamic that we're still in the throes of, I thought, P.T. Barnum has become president. <laughs> I mean, ge generally speaking, that's not a good thing for P.T. Barnum to become president. I thought, what does that mean about my country? And I looked around and I said, he wants to build a wall on the border. Hmm. He wants to say, make America great again. Hmm. He wants to say, let's put America first. Hmm. A lot of people take those uh, uh, characteristics of him as positives and they're prepared to vote for him, even some minorities, even some people who you might not have thought so. Rather than make it about as it became, Trump was a Russian uh, plant, Trump, Trump was an idiot, Trump was a grifter, Trump was a thief. Rather than make it about uh, Trump, let's make it about the arguments over, should we have a border? What should be our asylum policy? What are we going to do about the overextension of American empire and the uh, nation building uh, mode of uh, previous uh, administrations and so forth? What, what exactly is our, uh, is our argument? I thought the personification of Trump as an embodiment of evil was an avoidance of grappling with the uh, uh, currents in American political culture that he had caught and ridden into the White House. Come the election of 2020, Trump loses the election. He has some disputes. He's entitled to have disputes about uh, electoral outcomes. That's what you have courts for. He goes to courts. The courts won't hear the cases. They throw them out. He gets nowhere. And he decides that he's not going to step aside, but that he's going to double down. He's going to ratchet up. And he takes these precious institutions, which I revere, as a patriotic American who loves his country, into his hands. And he fucks with them, excuse me. He cast into doubt the very bedrock of the institutional integrity that we need to resolve political dispute in the country. That's unforgivable. Okay, I wrote in my blog and I said in my podcast, I was wrong about Donald Trump. I let my uh, annoyance with the overbearing uh, 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 politically correct uh, moral smugness of the left intelligentsia of the country, which I despise, and Trump's catching that sentiment and writing it into the White House, I let it cloud my judgment. He's not the right man for the country is what I think about Donald Trump, but he hasn't gone away. I acknowledge that there's a problem, <laughs> but I don't think it's white supremacy. I don't think the main characteristic of Trump is white supremacy. That's an opportunistic critique. I, I, I don't think that's at all. I think you got to get much closer. Factory closings, uh, dusty towns in the Midwest, uh, deaths of the, you're much closer to the uh, heart of the matter with Trump when you say failed elites, failed institutions, uh, media uh, empires that lie to the people for their own reasons, etc. People don't trust them anymore. You're much closer to the core of the issue with Trump. 
If you talk about that, then if you talk about white supremacy. And when you talk about white supremacy in the context of Trump, you just make it that much harder for the tens of millions of white people who you need to get anything done in this country to get on side. Glad I asked him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you for a very candid conversation. Uh, um, I have a few closing remarks here. We do have some time to pose questions um, individually uh, to Glenn and Khalil uh, during the reception. But that, that's, a, I think, a rare moment in our public life and even intellectual life, to have two of you, knowing you so strongly disagree, be, be candid and civil with each other. It's a real treat. So uh, just quickly, inf as I mentioned, information about our degree programs and our courses out at the uh, registration table, including a course taught by Professor Weinstein, who I mentioned. We have a law professor teaching an undergraduate course for us in the spring on free speech and, and civil debate in, uh, on campus. Um, the schedule of events we have in the spring, we have that out there as well. I'll just mention that for our annual Martin Luther King Day address, we have law professor Laura Bazelon in conversation with Jason Riley of the Wall Street Journal. That's in January. And then, and that is the second event in this Can We Speak Honestly About Race uh, series. And then the third event in the series is part of our annual conference. So we have Andrew Sullivan giving one keynote at the annual conference. And then the second keynote is by Camille Foster. And that will be actually the third event in this Can We Speak Honestly About Race uh, series. Thanks to our colleagues in the school. Um, we have the best events and communication staff here in the university. So Carol McNamara, our Associate Director of the School for Public Programs. Uh, Morgan and, uh, and um, Marlene um, in our events staff, uh, Marcia and Vanessa in our communications team. As I mentioned, thanks to the O'Connor College of Law, uh, to Jim Weinstein and the interim dean and Chudera for their support. Thanks to Arizona PBS. Uh, and we hope you will stay for the reception. We hope to see you at future events. And with that, please join me one final thanks to Glenn Lowry and Khalil Mohammed. Oh, yeah.